Good morning. Welcome to the Daily Word. It is Friday, July the 17th, and we are in Acts 27. In this particular chapter, Paul sailing for Rome. Let's go ahead and read it together. If you need to hit pause and grab your Bible, go ahead and do that, or just follow along. And then I want to talk about a few key things from the passage, maybe answer a couple questions as well that might come up in your mind, and then talk about one key takeaway. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion, of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramitium, or Adramitium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. So don't get tongue-tied as you're reading and pronouncing all these big random words. Uh, the next day we put out, or put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us aboard. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off of Snidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Haven, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion, the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. But soon, a tempestuous wind, called the Northeaster, struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along, running under the lee of a small island called Kata. We managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship, then, fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo, and on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun or stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up amongst them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail for Crete or from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you, take heart. But there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Don't be afraid, Paul. You will stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that will, it will be exactly as I've been told. But we must run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little farther on they took a sounding again and found fifteen fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes in the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you, take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. 
Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 266, 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, and at the same time, loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach, but striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Uh, 44 verses, a lot of big words, a lot of weird names, but we get through it and we see, I think, some interesting references. First of all, uh, something that you won't know, perhaps unless you study elsewhere and count them up, is this is one of three shipwrecks that the Apostle Paul goes through. And that's insightful for us because we really get a sense of appreciation for all that he went through for the gospel. And I think we can take away the sense that it's always worth it. Amen. Also, uh, a couple of more things that revolve around numbers. Uh, 14 night storm, 15 days. That is a long time to be tossed to and fro on a ship. And I think it's important to realize, and this will really be important for the takeaway from this particular chapter, that Paul is in that. You know, it's easy to think of maybe the centurion and all the passengers, all you know, 276 of them, including Paul. Uh, but Paul is with them in that. And so don't miss that as we talk about the key takeaway. A couple of questions perhaps you might ask is why would soldiers uh, just kill them all in verse 42? Well, Romans had a law, and that is the prisoners you were watching were under your care, and your life was attached to them properly being delivered to their destination. In other words, if a prisoner escaped under your watch, you were killed. And so these centurions and soldiers are thinking, these guys are going to try to escape anyway. They assumed these men and prisoners would try to escape. So let's just kill them all. That way they don't escape. Nobody swims away or escapes. And then we don't have to lose our own necks. And so they're going to kill them all. Uh, another question, why did the centurion save Paul? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't particularly say at this instance, but perhaps he's developing a compassion. Perhaps just pure logic and, and maybe manhood would say, Hey, I appreciate this guy who warned us. Turns out he was right. And then he didn't really rub it in too much and say, I told you so too much. He did once. But then he said, hey, let's eat, be encouraged. And Paul seemed to have some good advice. Perhaps the centurion uh, was softening towards him, realizing he's a special man, or maybe even softening towards the gospel witness that Paul was exhibiting. Next, uh, you might be asking, what's a fathom? We talked about, you know, the fathoms that they were measuring out. It's a measurement of six feet, or in some cases, they would stretch their arms out. And from the tip of one middle finger to the tip of another middle finger, uh, roughly six feet. And so those measurements are six feet. They were measuring depth that way. Uh, now, a takeaway in a text like this, pretty simple in my mind. Uh, Paul, the apostle, is on the same ship in the same storm being beaten down by the same waves, not seeing the same sun, stuck, same 14 nights, 15 days. But the way he handled it is different than everybody else around him. I think there's a takeaway there that a believer may go through the same storms, the same challenges, the same circumstances as anybody else in this world. We're not immune to that, right? God never, doesn't just promise, oh, I'm going to take you out of the pain, but he'll say, I'll take you through the pain. But a believer is strengthened by God and his promises. For Paul, it was the vision, the appearance of an angel of the Lord coming, God telling him basically, hey, this is what's going to happen. Uh, for you and I, okay, maybe it's not God himself or an angel of the Lord coming to see us and tell us, hey, it's going to be a great day tomorrow. Uh, but we have his promises in his word. Uh, we have his unchanging nature. We have the ability to look back at men like Paul the Apostle and say, look at what he went through. 
He held on to God's promise at that time for him. I could hold on to God's promise at this time for me. And so don't ever forget that you are going to go through the same storms as everybody else. But as a believer, you get the unique opportunity to be strengthened by strength that is out of this world. It's God's strength. That's what you can cling to. That's the hope you can hold on to. And the Apostle Paul is a great example. Uh, that really is the, the, the so-called secret of Christianity, is that we just have a higher hope than this world. Uh, the, the secret, which really isn't a secret, we're doing our best to tell everybody the secret, is that there is a person named Jesus, and his power is everything for our lives. And so in whatever you're enduring today, remember that uh, as a believer, you're not entitled to be given an easy way out, but you are entitled with rights as a child of God to a strengthened way or an easy way through, which is the easy yoke that God gives us. Uh, there'll still be a yoke. There'll still be burdens. There'll still be challenges. But he is holding on to you and you also in response holding on to him. I love you, church. Hope you're encouraged by Paul's actions and reactions in the midst of the storm and in whatever storms you go through that you follow his example and ultimately the example of Jesus. I'll see you one more time tomorrow as we close out the book of Acts with chapter 28.